Okay, so um, before we start uh, with uh, Amin's uh, course, which is a uh, part of part of um, this um, theme on uh, things linked to spin glasses and the interactions between uh, probability computer science and theoretical uh, physics, I'll uh, just uh, take a few minutes to remind you of how uh, things work. Um, in terms of questions, so uh, for the questions, uh, you should uh, ask them directly in the chat. And uh, our expert in the room today is uh, Max, um, and he's going to answer as many questions as possible. And if needed, he'll um, interrupt. Um, I mean, so that um, he can answer the question more broadly. Uh, Apart from the chat, we also have a short break after half an hour where uh, I mean, we'll answer directly your questions. And at um, the end of the talk, uh, so uh, in one hour, we'll have um, a longer period where you'll be able to unmute yourselves and uh, ask the questions directly. So um, uh, just uh, to remind you that this is recorded and streamed live on YouTube. So if you don't want your face on the internet, please turn off your uh, camera. Uh, now I'll take just a few seconds to tell you about the schedule. So I mean, uh, has kindly agreed to give three lectures. So there's the one today. There'll be uh, one tomorrow at uh, 1.30 p.m., not at 12 p.m. And uh, then on Friday, the last lecture at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time once again. And uh, on top of this, uh, tomorrow we'll have a lecture by uh, Eliran Subag at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so, um, with this in mind, I think, uh, I will uh, give it up to, uh, I mean, uh, so that, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for agreeing to give this lectures. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing about all this. So I'll give it up to okay. you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, so let me see if I can. Uh, can you see my slides actually? Not yet. Uh, you have to share your own screen again. Okay. Is it working now? Yeah, perfect. All right, very good. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, one of the most, maybe the most, um, exciting development in probabilistic combinatorics in the, in the last 10 or 20 years or so has been the discovery that there's a close connection between a lot of questions about discrete random objects like, for example, random graphs and random matrices and the statistical mechanics of disordered systems. And as a result, what has, what has happened is that um, new proof methods in random graphs have been developed that are strongly influenced by um, ideas such as replica symmetry breaking, for example, um, an idea from the theory of disordered systems that you already heard a bit about in Orkush's lecture. So in this lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you um, a brief overview of this connection between these two different um, areas. And in particular, in lecture one, I'm going to give you an overview a little bit about random graphs and the phase transitions that we expect in them in, them in light of the um, ideas from statistical mechanics. I'm going to give you um, an overview of the way, if you like, the lens through which physicists look at random graphs and um, their main tool, the main tool that they wield, something called the cavity method. The cavity method is an analytic but mathematically non-rigorous um, tool. And it has led to, mathematically speaking, quite a number of intriguing conjectures, some of which have by now been um, proved rigorously. And at the same time, it has also guided us in finding mathematical proofs. Even though the method itself is non-rigorous, it has inspired new proof techniques. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the connection to classical proof techniques, such as the first and the second moment method, and um, about 
things like belief propagation and density evolution, which are tools that play a prominent role in the physics calculations and by now also in modern rigorous results about random graphs. In the second lecture, I'm going to give you a rigorous proof of a rather non-trivial prediction based on physics ideas, namely in the case of the random two-sub model. So um, I believe or I hope that in the second lecture, I'm going to be in a position to more or less give you a back-to-back -back proof of um, the physics prediction about the main quantity in the random two-sub problem. I'm going to obviously have to omit some of the technical calculations, but conceptually, I think it will be more or less um, a complete proof outline. Um, the details are written up in a paper, of course, but you will get, you will get hopefully a very good idea of how we can turn um, physics intuition into mathematical proofs in this lecture in the example of a non-trivial um, mathematical problem. And then in the third lecture, um, we are going to look at a different type of problem that has nonetheless been influenced recently by these same physics ideas. Namely, we are going to look at an inference problem called group testing. Uh, in this context, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the basics of Bayesian inference on random graphs and about the analysis of combinatorial algorithms on random structures. And we are going to see a new paradigm, a new technique called spatial coupling that can be used and is particularly useful in the context of inference problems. So, uh, I mean, just to explain group testing a little bit, um, I mean, imagine it, it seems completely outlandish just a few months back. Imagine there's a pandemic spreading across the planet and uh, you want to identify um, people that are infected with this rare disease so that you can either quarantine them or maybe uh, cure them or uh, otherwise maybe trace their contacts. And um, to this end, you want to use your test uh, capacity, your capacity for conducting tests for uh, the pathogen as effectively as possible. And <clears throat> group testing is a strategy for testing a big number of patients for a rare disease with the smallest possible number of individual test kits. So we are going to look at this and it will emerge that actually um, these ideas like, for example, belief propagation hold the key to the precise answer to this problem. So let me briefly begin by explaining a little bit um, what disordered systems have to do with random graphs and what disordered systems are in the first place. Of course, uh, those of you who attended Orkish's lecture already know quite a bit about this, but um, for the others, a good example of a disordered system is uh, just a piece of glass. I mean, either uh, the window pane that you're looking through or maybe a glass bottle on your table. And the reason this is a disordered physical object is because the glass was produced by annealing, by cooling down material um, at a sufficiently fast pace so that there wasn't enough time for the individual atoms to arrange themselves in a crystalline structure. As a result, because of this relatively fast annealing process, um, we have a quenched disorder. We have not a, re not a perfectly regular um, lattice-like structure like in a crystal, but we have a, a topology of oxygen and silicon atoms, for example, that is random, that is um, disordered. It is not um, perfectly regular. So that, that's an example of a disordered system. Um, and this is what physicists would call a structural glass, a glass where the disorder, a disordered system where the disorder is in the geometric arrangement of the individual atoms. There's a different kind of um, disordered systems, system called a spin glass. And that is, for example, what you get by um, annealing, by rapidly uh, cooling down 
um, a magnetic alloy, for example, I think uh, iron and gold would work. And this uh, rapidly cooled down magnet, uh, metallic alloy is going to evince a very peculiar disordered behavior when it comes to uh, magnetism, to ferromagnetism. And that is what we call spin glasses. So uh, maybe uh, for, for the start, maybe for intuition, a good way of uh, thinking about disordered systems is this picture here of a structural glass. Now, of course, um, this annealing process takes place in three-dimensional space and uh, our atoms live in three-dimensional space. So ideally, from a physics viewpoint, we would like to analyze such models um, in a three-dimensional or anyway, finite dimensional geometry. And of course, there actually are lattice models of glasses, of structural glasses or of spin glasses. Orkush, for example, mentioned the edwards Anderson model. And these are intriguing models, um, but unfortunately, they are um, notoriously difficult to get a handle on even non-rigorously. And so um, these models exist, but they are essentially uh, at this point in time, as far as I'm aware, pretty much out of reach for us. And so uh, my, my metaphor for science is always that science is a bit like getting home uh, after a night at the pub. And so uh, you are pretty drunk and maybe somewhere halfway you realize that, that you lost your key. So you start searching for your key and maybe you start searching under a lantern. And now imagine a policeman coming by and a policeman asks you, well, um, what are you doing there? And of course you answer, well, uh, officer, I'm looking for my key. And uh, the answer back from the policeman might be, well, um, okay, where, where did you lose your key? And maybe our drunkard <clears throat> might at that point point, might at that time point at a dark corner somewhere on the other end of the street and might say, well, I lost it somewhere over there. And uh, the obvious question from the policeman, of course, would be, well, if you lost your uh, key over there in that dark corner, then why are you looking here? To which the answer is, uh, I'm looking here because the light is a lot better. And so um, this is more or less how science works. So there's this, this model that might be awfully um, realistic in some sense, might be a very accurate model of what's actually happening in reality. But unfortunately, we can say precious little about it. It's somewhere in a dark corner. So instead, what we might want to do is we might want to look for our key under the lantern. And <clears throat> so we might look for, we might look at a model, you might want to study a model that is easier to get a handle on. And one family of models that share that characteristic is uh, classical mean field models, like for example, the model that um, you heard about in the previous lecture, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And um, that is a type of model that completely gets rid of any kind of underlying geometry. So in that model, you have complete interactions between all the atoms effectively in your system. But of course, to make up for um, the huge number of potential, the, the huge number of interactions in your system, um, what you do is you introduce this uh, one over square root n factor that you might remember from the SK model uh, to make these interactions very, very weak. Um, so you, you have complete interaction, but you have very weak interactions. And that's, that's one type of model to look at. And you can potentially maybe in many ways learn quite a lot by studying this type of model. But a different type of model that is maybe a bit closer to um, a geometric model is what is called a diluted mean field model. And these are models of such disordered systems where the underlying geometry on which your atoms live is not given by a geometric structure like a lattice, but it is given by the topology of a sparse random graph. Now, by comparison to these complete interaction mean field models, the uh, intuitive advantage of a sparse random graph from a physics angle 
is of course that you have at least some kind of a geometry. It is not a three dimensional geometry, but you have at least something like um, a notion of distance and you actually have strong interactions between individual neighbors. So for example, in a sparse random graph, you might have um, a real topology where every atom, every vertex in your graph has a bounded expected number of neighbors. So you actually get locally at least some kind of a geometric structure. And also uh, because you get rid of this complete interaction, you can actually realistically um, mirror short range interactions by saying that um, interactions take place between a vertex and its neighbors. And these interactions are just as intense, just as um, direct and strong as they would have been in the lattice model. So in other words, these models on a random graph are halfway houses, halfway points between classical mean field models like the SK model and lattice models. So that's the physical uh, motivation for studying such models. And by coincidence, it so happens that the physical intuition about these models also sheds light on quite a number of questions that arise classically in probabilistic combinatorics, for example, in the theory of random graphs. So uh, for as a specific example of a type of random graph that we might look at, think of the um, binomial, sometimes so-called Adoshwini random graph, GMP. We have n vertices, x1 up to xn. And we have an edge probability p um, that is defined as some real parameter d divided by n. And that means that on the average, every vertex in your graph has d neighbors. Uh, to be more precise, the number of neighbors of a given vertex is going to be cos or d distributed approximately. And so locally, the structure of this random graph resembles a cos or d golden Watson tree. So if you start exploring your random graph from some particular vertex, um, what you're going to see for a long time looks like a golden Watson tree. So we recover this physical um, notion of one site, one um, atom in your system having a bounded number of immediate neighbors. And um, so we can, we can try to maybe um, study physical models on this type, this type of a geometry. Uh, two more words about this, the local geometry of a random graph. Um, because you get a Poisson D Gordon Watson tree locally, um, this means that locally your graph is acyclic. So if you look at any bounded distance from a given vertex, for example, you explore your random graph up to distance 100 about vertex X1, then um, you're not likely to see any cycles. So the first cycles you're going to see likely emerge once you move um, by distance something like log n away from the root vertex. Um, so locally, um, up to any bounded distance, your random graph is going to be acyclic with high probability, or more or less acyclic with high probability. Okay, so here's an example of a physical model that we might want to study on such a random graph. It's uh, the random graph version of a classical model from statistical mechanics, um, something called the Potts antiferromagnet that some of you might have heard about. And so here's how it works. You fix a D greater than zero, the average number of neighbors that a given vertex in your graph is likely to have. You fix a number Q of colors, at least two, and you fix a parameter beta a uh, positive parameter beta that we call the inverse temperature in your system. So this means that higher beta correspond physically to lower temperatures. And in terms of these um, parameters and the random graph G that ensues, we can define a probability distribution called the Boltzmann distribution on color assignments. So 
um, these sigmas here are assignments of colors to the vertices of the graph. Every vertex gets one of Q possible colors. And um, the probability mass under this Boltzmann distribution of one particular coloring is uh, given by this expression here. So we are going to come to this normalizing term in a bit. Before that, um, what's, what stands here is the product over all the edges of the graph, e to the minus beta times the indicator that the two end vertices of this edge receive the co same color. In other words, e to the minus beta times the indicator that the edge is monochromatic. For example, this edge here would be monochromatic. And um, whenever you see a monochromatic edge, you add an e to the minus beta penalty factor to the probability of that particular coloring. And if the edge is bichromatic, you simply have a factor of one here. So uh, bichromatic edges uh, are not penalized or rewarded in any way. It's just that monochromatic edges um, receive an e to the minus beta penalty factor. And in order to turn this um, probability measure here, this Boltzmann, um, this, 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 this mu here, into a probability measure, we of course have to normalize um, so that the overall probability mass sums to one. And that is why we divide by um, this expression z here. This is something called the partition function. And that's simply the sum of all these individual Boltzmann weights of all the possible colorings. So the intuition behind this is that, um, of course, mu g beta is a probability mass on all possible color assignments. And um, the larger you choose beta, the greater the penalty that you impose on monochromatic edges. So for larger beta, you um, have a stronger preference for um, good colorings that leave few edges monochromatic. And of course, um, like always in, in statistical physics, there's a trade-off here between entropy and probability. There's going to be a huge number of potential coloring sigma that leave a lot of edges monochromatic. And if you make beta quite small, then presumably because just of the sheer number of possible poor quality colorings, these are going to dominate your measure. By contrast, if you make beta larger, you uh, have an eye for quality. You have a strong preference for very good quality colorings that uh, leave few edges monochromatic. Okay, so that much for the Boltzmann distribution. Um, now, as you might remember from the previous lectures, the key quantity for any such model is um, the partition function. If we understand, if you get a handle on the partition function, then um, we already make good progress towards actually understanding the probabilistic and combinatorial nature of the model. So that's certainly going to be a key quantity of interest for us. Another important remark at this point is that both the partition function and uh, the Boltzmann distribution are random objects. Namely, they both depend on the random graph G um, on which the system lives. So in physics language, we are going to be interested in the quenched version of this model where we first take a random graph G, then keep and fix this graph. We effectively carve the graph in stone. And then on this fixed random graph, we are going to be interested in studying these um, objects, the Boltzmann distribution and the partition function. Okay, now, um, according to our very good friends from physics, um, what happens in models like the POTS antiferromagnet and like very many others is that various phase transitions take place as you tune the model parameters. In this case, um, we might fix Q. So for example, fix Q to be 10, some fixed number of colors. 
And uh, we might also fix D to be some large number, maybe a thousand. And um, now there's one parameter left that we can play with that we might want to tune. And that is this um, inverse temperature parameter beta. So we are going to look at increasing beta, which means effectively that we are going to look at decreasing the temperature. And like I uh, said on the previous slide, this means that we are going to look at higher quality colorings, colorings with fewer, fewer monochromatic edges as we increase beta. Now, a good way to look at this kind of model is um, that you think of um, the space of configurations, um, the set of all possible colorings, like um, a plane. And on this plane, you have a function that tells you um, the number of monochromatic edges for each of the uh, for each of the uh, coloring. So for every to every color for every coloring, you have a height, which is effectively um, the number of monochromatic edges. And now there's going to be a lot of colorings, a huge number of colorings that sit at the plateau level um, of this picture that are at the top of this picture that have a huge number of monochromatic edges. Uh, so the simply there's going to be a lot of entropy there. There's going to be a lot of possible colorings at that level. And um, but there's also going to be a number of colorings that are better, that leave fewer edges um, monochromatic. So this means in this picture, you have um, a good number of troughs that um, come down from below up to some level. And these troughs correspond to local bubbles, to local clusters, um, local accumulations of higher quality colorings, to colorings that simply leave a smaller number of edges monochromatic. And um, so the way to think of this uh, model is that you, by tuning beta, you take cross sections of this landscape and the larger you make beta, um, the lower you, the lower the, the level at which you cut this landscape. For very large beta, you cut at a high level and for lower beta, you cut this um, stalagmite landscape at a lower level. And so according to physicists, what we will observe as we cut at lower and lower levels is um, a bunch of phase transitions. In the first phase, we are going to see something called replica symmetry. So the cross section is going to look more or less like a convex set, like one big bubble. And um, this in particular is deemed to imply that, for example, Markov chains um, are going to be rapidly mixing on the model. So a Markov chain is going, at this particular value of beta, a Markov chain is going to have an easy time navigating the landscape and producing samples from the Boltzmann distribution. And in particular, um, there's not going to be any long range correlations. So if you look at two vertices, x1 and x2, that are far apart from each other in the random graph topology, then the colors assigned to them are essentially in deep, stochastically independent. So the probability of seeing one particular color at x1 and one particular color at x2 is approximately equal to two, q to the minus two, number of colors to the minus two. Another um, feature um, of this is that there's some certain spatial uh, mixing properties, something called non-reconstruction. So for large um, temperatures for small values of beta, the model is quite simple. Now, what happens if you make beta just a little bit smaller? Um, what happens is that there's going to be a phase transition that goes under the um, catchy name of dynamic replica symmetry breaking in statistical physics. And um, so at this point, you are going to cut a lot of these troughs. You are still going to be uh, to, to cut a huge number of these troughs in your landscape. But um, the picture is now going to be disconnected. As you cut through, there's going to be different um, separated bubbles um, in your in your cross section. 
And this means that we don't expect Markov chains will be rapidly mixing anymore. So if you launch a Markov chain, it's bound to get trapped in one of these bubbles. Um, on the other hand, because there's still such a large number of bubbles, we do still expect to see um, the absence of long range correlations simply because correlations between these different bubbles effectively cancel out. So if you look at two far away vertices, then the colors assigned to them are still going to be essentially stochastically independent. And finally, there's uh, a phase called static replica symmetry breaking. And um, at this point in your cross section, there's only going to be a small number of dominant troughs. So there's not any, there's not that many troughs anymore that um, go as far down as, as uh, the point where you're cutting. So this means that your Boltzmann distribution effectively looks like a mixture of a small number of relatively narrow troughs in this picture. And as a result, we now do expect um, to see long range correlations, namely the colors of X1 and X2 are going to be correlated through another hidden random variable. And this hidden random variable is, um, if you like, the address or the number of the trough where the coloring comes from. And so these troughs are called in these, these few troughs that dominate the picture are called in statistical physics lingo, um, pure states. And um, these also play a big role in the context of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. Now, uh, just before we take the break, let me make one more point, namely one thing that you can um, ask is whether you can effectively turn this omelet on the other side. So in the previous, uh, um, so previously what we did was we first created a random graph and then chose a coloring. And so maybe we can actually put the omelet on the other side and first choose a coloring and then generate a random graph that goes with it. And this is actually something that can be done. This, is, uh, this leads to an inference problem. And this is exactly the connection between random graphs and disordered systems and statistical inference problems. So in this particular example, the inference problem that you end up with is something called the stochastic block model. There's uh, an amazing amount of literature on this, actually. And this is simply the uh, flipped omelet version of the POTS antiferromagnet. Namely, what you do is you first generate a random coloring uniformly, and then you choose a random graph uh, from this distribution here, namely the probability of hitting some particular graph capital G is simply proportional to the Boltzmann um, probability that sigma star would have under this random graph. And uh, so from an inference viewpoint, the question would be, given this random graph G star, can we at least partially uh, infer sigma star? And uh, because of the connection between um, this inference problem and the POTS antiferromagnet, these ideas like replica symmetry breaking and so on are actually useful to answer this sort of question. So uh, let's maybe take a five minute break and um, then I'm going to proceed um, with some, uh, in some more detail with the um, random TUSA problem. And uh, I'm going to give you some more details and fit in some of the um, blank spots in this high level picture. Okay, thank you. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. So there's already one. I don't know if you have access to it. Well, it's good. I can you describe again how the landscape is constructed or defined. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, so this landscape is actually something called the Hamiltonian in uh, physics language. And so this Hamiltonian is simply a map. Um, yeah. And it's a map from the space of all possible color assignments. 
to um, the non-negative numbers. And what it simply does is it simply maps a given coloring to the number of monochromatic edges. And, and physicists really, um, from a physics viewpoint, the Hamiltonian is a, is a very important object and plays a pivotal role in the definition of many such models. So um, in this picture that I showed, think of the um, two-dimensional plane, the x and y axis, as it were, as um, the cube uh, one up to q to the n. Of course, that's not really a plane. It's a very high dimensional combinatorial cube. Um, nonetheless, at least metaphorically, let's think of it as a plane. And the Hamiltonian is simply a, a function um, that sits on this plane, effectively a three dimensional function that defines this landscape. And what I, what I showed you was actually not the Hamiltonian itself, but the flipped Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian with the minus in front, basically. Uh, right, so um, yeah, the question is, can you explain the last slide once more? You can share the screen again. Okay. So, uh, right, so the, the POTS model has an inference problem. So, uh, right. Um, so previously what we did was we said, well, you take a uh, random graph and then subsequently you define, uh, subsequently you, you choose a, uh, a configuration from this random graph. Now, what we do here is we, we turn the tables. We basically say, you know what, just first um, choose a coloring uniformly at random. Take uh, a random coloring uniformly without looking at any graphs, without asking anybody at all. Just go to your room um, and secretly generate your random coloring, then come back and um, generate a random graph to go with it. And uh, this random graph is, um, is defined so that it tends to fit your coloring. So roughly speaking, you say, well, I'm for, for a given specific graph, I look at the probability mass that this particular coloring would have under the Boltzmann distribution of this graph. So e to the minus beta times the number of monochromatic edges. And this expression, e to the minus beta times number of monochromatic edges, is roughly how much I like this graph. So I'm going to like graphs better that have fewer monochromatic edges under this coloring that um, happen to have fewer edges that link vertices of the same color under this particular coloring. Um, and I'm going to dislike graphs that have a lot of edges that fall inside the color classes of this particular color. Now, in the case of an adage or any model, you could alternatively say you choose every edge independently um, so that you have this e to the minus beta penalty factor for a monochromatic edge. And um, you have, um, and you don't have this penalty factor for a bichromatic edge. And so what you end up with is a random graph um, with, I suppose we condition on the number of edges with some specific number of edges. And you can ask yourself, for example, is this random graph that you get this way going to be distinguishable in any way from um, the purely random um, adush rini like random graph? And if the answer is no, then unfortunately, it's not going to be um, possible for you to reconstruct the coloring from which I started to generate this random graph. And if the answer is yes, then maybe you have a chance. And it turns out that this uh, static replica symmetry breaking phase transition is precisely the point um, from there on, it's going to be possible for you to get back at the coloring sigma star that you started from. And so um, this stochastic block model, which has been studied since the 80s um, out of independent interest uh, in various communities actually can be solved indirectly by way of understanding the POTS model on the random graph. So that's the connection between 
inference and um, a random graph. So the next question is uh, small, uh, right? So what, what is a small value of beta? What is a large value of beta? Um, so this is not quite so easy. So, so the precise formulas are, are a bit tricky. Uh, I, I didn't put them on the slides, but I can easily put, uh, I, I could uh, maybe add a reference where these values are worked out uh, to some extent. So let me, let me do that at the end of the lecture. I'm going to put in a reference what small and large beta mean. It's not as easy as um, one smaller than one or greater than one, like it would be in the uh, Curie-Weiss model, for example. Okay. Uh, yeah. Max, are you still there? Yeah, he's still yes, sure I am. Okay, good. Yeah, so you can also ask Max uh, any questions while I'm rumbling on. Uh, so don't, yeah, don't hesitate to ask Max. So, yeah. Any other questions? He's asking if there's an intuitive way to uh, picture of full RSB uh, solutions, the uh, solution geometry of full RSB. Curious about that myself. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes and no. I mean, so the best, um, the best intuitive way of describing full RSB or let, let's say, okay, so the best way of describing this is, um, I suppose, in terms of the um, asymptotic Gibbs measures um, that, that you can describe. So, um, in, so let's look at the one RSB picture first. I, I didn't actually discriminate between one RSB and, and full RSB in, uh, on the sli in the slides that I showed. So um, the one RSB picture would basically be that you have, um, if, if you look at these different um, contributions, these different little uh, bubbles that remain in the static replica symmetry breaking phase, uh, that these bubbles are kind of almost isomorphic from one another, and that they are distributed more or less uniformly over this landscape. So you have, have bubbles that carry different Boltzmann weights, but these weights are different only by a fairly small amount. So they, I mean, there's only a constant factor weight between them, so they, they don't differ a whole lot. And what we would expect is that if you zoom in onto any one of these bubbles, you would effectively see a very similar um, picture locally. And these bubbles are more or less uniformly spread all over this place. You can think of them kind of like, um, like a basis in an L2 Hilbert space. They are essentially orthogonal. Uh, in the full RSB picture, it's uh, different. You get a hierarchical um, decomposition. So these, I mean, if you like this, there's a hierarchy of bubbles. There's, um, so each of these bubbles would in turn again decompose into bubbles, which would again decompose into bubbles and so on and so forth. So that's um, the, I guess that's the only intuitive picture that I can give. Um, but I think it's not such, I mean, from a combinatorial viewpoint, it's not such a big mystery, I would say, as it's always or sometimes made out to be. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the detailed explanation. I think we'll uh, cut this exercise, this uh, question uh, part for now, and uh, we can ask more questions at the end of the talk if you want, because these are uh, more general questions. So I'll let you continue and we can go over time a little bit if you need. Okay, I'll rubble on them. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now let's. Uh, try to make this to some extent a bit more concrete. 
So, I mean, we have this intuitive picture maybe in mind to some extent about replica symmetry breaking and about, um, yeah, about these different phase transitions. So uh, let's look at uh, a concrete example, a concrete installment of a problem that these methods can be, these physics methods at first can be put to work. And uh, let's inspect a little bit the proof techniques that we have in our arsenals to maybe um, verify some of these uh, statistical physics predictions. So um, there's of course a bunch of classical random graph techniques that uh, are time honored and that still have uh, their place in the context of these um, disordered systems. So one example of this is uh, the method of moments. Um, it's great if it works, uh, but it doesn't always work or well, maybe it works, but uh, with an extreme um, amount of complication in some cases. Um, there's of course the um, concept of branching processes that uh, play a big role in order to understand the local geometry of random graphs. And there's large deviations techniques, uh, things like understanding rate functions or large deviations inequalities that you might uh, find handy in some places. Uh, so these are kind of classical random graph techniques that you find uh, in the book, literally. And, but more recently, there have been some very successful uh, mathematical physics inspired techniques or statistical physics inspired techniques. Um, and these are things like coupling arguments. We are going to see um, the eisenman sim star scheme, for example, in the next lecture. Um, there's the idea of exchangeable arrays and something called the cup metric, which is a way of um, connecting high dimensional discrete probability distributions, like, for example, the Boltzmann distributions of our various disordered systems um, with analytic methods. Um, there's the belief propagation message passing scheme and um, something called the contraction method from probability theory. And of course, one very important technique in the context of disordered systems is the uh, interpolation method first developed by Guerra for the study of the SK model, but by now in widespread use also in the theory of random graphs. And uh, there have been quite a few success stories where this connection between disordered systems and uh, random graphs has been um, used to great effect. For example, there's some work on the geometry of solution spaces. For example, Mike Molloy's beautiful paper on the freezing phase transitions in uh, random constraint satisfaction problems. There's um, the random KSAT problem um, where, there, where, where there's been a line of work that culminated in the article by Ding Sly and Son on the KSAT um, transition. There's been a very uh, yeah, beautiful and um, outstanding work on low density parity check codes, where these ideas from disordered systems have, have been used in order to develop new error correcting codes. And low density parity check codes actually are a very successful class of codes that are part of communication standards. So um, you actually carry them around with you in your pockets because they are built into your smartphones. Uh, the stochastic block model is a nice benchmark of a clustering problem that has been receiving quite a bit of attention. And of course, I'm going to speak about group testing. So what I want to say is that this connection between disordered systems and uh, random graphs and inference problems has been uh, quite a success story with uh, some real world applications as well, like these low density parity check codes, or like I said, um, group testing. So uh, to give you one example of a theorem, of what, what a typical rigorous theorem in this area looks like without going into any details. This is a result from a paper that we had in 2017 about um, the POTS model on a random graph. And what this theorem tells you is um, the static uh, replica symmetry breaking transition in your random graph model. So uh, the characteristic feature of this theorem is 
that the result comes out in terms of a variational problem. So an optimization problem on a space of probability measures. In this case, all probability measures pi on the standard simplex in RQ, whose barycenter is the uniform distribution. And the function that you're supposed to maximize is something that is called in physics jargon the beta free energy. And that is a function that looks a bit like this. So it talks about a lot of independent samples from this distribution pi that you're optimizing over. And your uh, phase transition is characterized by a, um, an equation that tells you, well, look for the optimal solution to your variational problem. If it hits a particular value, that is where your phase transition is. And uh, so the, so the, uh, uh, the point about this is that, uh, and, and I think this in should actually be a soup. Uh, and so the point about this is that um, we may not end up with a formula that is quite as explicit as <clears throat> some formulas that you get in combinatorics. So you don't get something that you can punch into maple and get a solution right away. But um, what you do get is you get a characterization that tells you that these physics ideas, these ideas about replica symmetry breaking and belief propagation actually get to the bottom of the problem. So even though you might not be able to um, punch this into a computer algebra system as it stands, the punchline of this result, the upshot of this theorem is that the cavity method, the physics ideas can be taken as they are. You can put uh, rigorous tracks beneath them and run the calculations on them. And um, this is, there's no gap, there's, it leaves nothing on the table. This physics intuition actually hits the nail on the head. And so even though it looks maybe a bit uh, frightening at first glance, this is the kind of theorem that we typically aim for. So what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to tell you a little bit about how the the two sub problem from um, combinatorics looks through the lens of the cavity method and um, what kind of ideas we would bring to bear and what predictions we would make. So the two sub problem is a, a classical problem uh, from combinatorics, from logic, if you like. Uh, you have Boolean variables x1 up to xn. So these are variables that can take the values true or false, which we represent by plus one and minus one by easing spins. And uh, we are going to use these Boolean variables to construct um, propositional formulas. And these formulas will be uh, composed of such ors, such disjunctions of literals. And the disjunctions that, we, uh, that are possible are, well, such positive disjunctions where you just take two variables and put an or between them, or disjunctions that might involve negation. So this, might, this would be xi or not xj. So if uh, X, xi is set to true, this, would be, uh, this, this expression would evaluate to true. And if, if xj is set to false, it would also evaluate to true and so on. And now a two such formula is simply a big and of many such clauses of many such ors. So a two such formula is a big and of many ors and each of these ors has two uh, literals, has two separate um, literals. And uh, of course, we are going to be interested in satisfying assignments. So we are going to be interested in assignments that simultaneously satisfy all of these M clauses. And in particular, we would like to count such assignments. We would like to know how many there are. And so Z of phi, our partition function in this case, is simply just the number of satisfying assignments. Uh, here's an example of a two sub formula. So we have um, three clauses in this case. The first clause is not X1 or X2 and so on. And of course, you can represent this uh, two sub formula by a graph with these little boxes representing the clauses and the circles representing the Boolean variables and the color of the edge indicates whether the variable appears positively or negatively 
in the clause. And in this specific example, you see that um, there's two satisfying assignments. One is uh, where all the where, uh, x1 and x2 are set to true, and x3 is set to false. And the other one is, uh, in this case, interesting enough, the binary inverse of the first. And uh, so in a way, you could say that this two sub problem is glassy. It's a disordered um, problem because the variables um, appear in the clauses, sorry, with different signs. So for example, this variable here is dragged into two different directions by this clause and by that clause. So this clause would rather have x2 take the value false, and this one would rather have uh, x2 be set to true. So uh, x2 is kind of uh, dragged into two different directions, like in a disordered system where we don't really have a crystalline structure, but a structure that uh, is, is somewhat disordered. There's um, not a perfect solution, maybe, uh, in every case. Of course, we are looking for a satisfying assignment, but there's not a way to let's say in this case, make all the edges get what they want. Okay, so this, that's an example of a two-sat um, instance. And of course, um, the, you may have heard that the KSAT problem plays a big role in computer science. Um, now, fortunately, it has been known for quite a long time that two-sat can actually be solved in polynomial time. So there's an efficient algorithm that will tell you uh, whether a given two-sat formula has a satisfying assignment. In fact, also find a satisfying assignment if there is one. Uh, however, counting the number of satisfying assignments is a different kettle of fish. That's uh, actually a hard computational problem. And in fact, Valiant showed in 79 that this problem is not just NP hard, but it's a problem that belongs to a even worse complexity class, namely this class uh, number P. And it's number p hard, um, which means that in particular, if you could solve this problem in polynomial time, you would collapse uh, p and np. Okay, so counting satisfying assignments is still a hard problem. And so maybe it's not surprising, therefore, that even on random um, two such formulas, the problem is still rather non trivial. So how do we generate such a random two-sat formula? Well, we um, fix some, like in the random graph case, we fix some degree d between zero and infinity, some finite number. And now we include um, Poisson dn on two um, clauses in our random formula. And these clauses are simply drawn independently and uniformly at random. So we simply, uh, we simply put down m uniformly random independent clauses and connect them with our variables. Also the colors of the edges, the signs with which the literals appear in the clauses are of course chosen randomly. And uh, if I look at this picture from the variable side, then I'm in a similar situation like in the POTS model that I described earlier. Namely, I'm going to see um, that the degree distribution of the variables is um, Poisson uh, D. And uh, of course, what we are going to be interested in, like I said, is um, the partition function. In particular, we would like to know, first of all, of course, is um, the partition function positive? Do we have satisfying assignments? And assuming that we do, uh, what is the limit in probability of uh, the number of satisfying assignments, or to be more precise, as it will turn out, we should really be looking at um, one on n log of the number of satisfying assignments because it will turn out that there's exponentially many of them. So to get a reasonable finite limit, we have to normalize um, by uh, one on n log. Okay, so uh, there's been quite a bit of prior work on this. Let me uh, run you through that quickly. Um, the threshold for um, the partition function being non-zero is actually known and has been known for a long time. This is a result that was independently obtained by Quartal and Reed and by Gert. Uh, and in 96, actually, um, Monasson and Zekina also used the cavity method to um, 
to derive a prediction of um, the typical number of satisfying assignments via the cavity method. And uh, the goal is going to be for us to prove that prediction. First, we are going to look at how they derive this prediction, and then we are going to try and prove it. And uh, there have been some partial results uh, towards this result already. So for example, most importantly, there was this paper by um, Abi and um, Montanari from 2014 that uh, determined that, that proved the existence of a deterministic limit for um, the number of satisfying assignments, or more precisely, the suitably normalized number of satisfying assignments. So they proved that this function phi of d exists so that um, your number of satisfying assignments suitably normalized converges in probability to phi of d, but um, failed to actually compute phi of d or to prove that phi of d matches um, the result of uh, predicted by um, Monasson and Zekina. So let's briefly speak about the satisfiability threshold and about the way we can bring random graphs into this game. So one thing you can observe is that a clause in all of two uh, literals is logically equivalent to two implications. Namely, the or is uh, equivalent to not L implying L, L prime uh, and, uh, and vice versa. And so this means that your, um, your formula is going to be satisfiable unless there is an unlucky chain of implications that starts at xi. I mean, in the, once I put down these, once I transform the clauses into implications, there's an, unlikely, an unlucky chain of implications, namely one that takes xi to not xi through some intermediate steps, and then takes xi and not xi back to xi. And of course, such a chain of implications cannot be satisfied. And uh, such chains are called bicycles in, uh, in TUSAT uh, jargon. So here's an example of, of a bicycle. Here's your, here's your variable xi. And if you um, retranslate the colors into signs of literals, what you see is that uh, this bicycle here, this um, structure precisely encodes such an unlucky um, double chain of implications. And uh, of course, we can try to use percolation arguments, um, arguments like that, that you may know from uh, the study of the giant component in random graphs in order to compute the threshold for the emergence of these of such bicycles. Um, so effectively, this means that we have to um, check whether a certain branching process uh, is super critical or not. And that is precisely the gist of the work by uh, Quartal and Reed and by Gert. So they effectively compute the threshold for the emergence of bicycles and discover that if your average degree is less than two, then your formula is unlikely con to contain bicycles. And for d greater than two bicycles uh, abound, there's a lot of them actually. And so what's the intuition between this? Where does this um, number two come from? Well, suppose you start, um, suppose you, you start uh, exploring your random two-set formula from some variable. And suppose you set that variable to a specific value. Let's say you, you set it to uh, true. Then the effect will be that you satisfy all the clauses where that variable appears positively. But unfortunately, you fail to satisfy all the clauses where your variable appears negatively. So in this example, the two clauses, these two black clauses, are unfortunately not satisfied by the parent variable. So these variables will have to ask their child variables to please satisfy them. So this means that they have to, they are going to force their children to take specific truth values that will satisfy them. So this child here, for example, is connected to its parent clause by a blue edge. So in order to satisfy its parent clause, it has to take the value blue. And this one here similarly has to take the value red. And um, so unfortunately, this 
variable here that has been forced to take the value true um, will fail to satisfy one of its children, which will therefore have to propagate um, the good word down to its children that uh, they will have to satisfy the clause. And so this will um, continue. And now you can imagine that uh, you get yourself into trouble if this propagation process here, this forcing process, um, is super critical, if it will, with some positive probability, actually um, continue for an unbounded amount of time. Because in that case, there's a good chance that you will run into a loop and thereby close um, a bicycle. And that is precisely the kind of argument that you find in these um, papers. It's uh, encoded a bit differently in these two uh, contributions, but this is basically the gist of it. Uh, okay, so um, that was our first classical method, our first classical random graph technique, the theory of branching processes and this kind of propagation argument. Um, and now let's try to see whether we can also use our other classical tricks, like, for example, the second moment method. So can we actually try and use the second moment method easily to compute um, the partition function, the number of satisfying assignments. So one observation is, of course, that uh, we can always get an upper bound on log z on the logarithm of the number of satisfying assignments by uh, using Jensen's inequality. So we can uh, certainly say that with high probability, with probability tending to 1 in the limit as n goes to infinity, log z the log of the number of satisfying assignments is upper bounded by the log of the expectation of z, okay, given um, the number of clauses. So we can certainly um, upper bound z by its expectation plus a little o of n error term. And this is basically just using Jensen's inequality or if you prefer uh, Markov's inequality. And so, now we could say, well, maybe we are in luck and maybe this inequality sign is actually an equality sign. And maybe we are really, really lucky and we can prove that this inequality is an equality by simply using the second moment method, by simply computing the second moment of um, the number of satisfying assignments. So uh, yeah, let's, let's try and carry this program out. First, computing the first moment is easy. Um, so simply by linearity of expectation, we can take, um, we can write the first moment as the sum over all possible assignments, probability that a particular assignment is satisfying. Now, fortunately for us, once we condition on the number of clauses, the probability that a particular assignment happens to be satisfying is precisely three quarters. And that is because if you fix an assignment and uh, an assignment of two variables, and now you drop a random two clause on these two variables, in three cases out of four, um, your clause is going to be satisfied. And the reason is that, um, so for example, suppose I set them both to true, I set both the variables to true, that there's precisely one way of choosing the signs of the literals that will unfortunately leave the clause unsatisfied. And in the case where I set the two literals to true, that one unlucky case is if I put negations in front of both my variables. So for any one assignment, the probability of being satisfying is three quarters to the number of clauses, and there's two to the n um, possible assignments. So my expectation, my expectation of z is simply two to the n times three quarters to the m. And so if I take logs i uh, and, and write uh, and recall that m is Poisson dn on two, I uh, end up with this um, tiny little expression down here. 
Okay, so the first moment was easy. That's encouraging. Let's go for the second moment. So maybe, like I said, we are really lucky and um, our second moment turns out to be not a whole lot bigger than the square of the first moment. Uh, so let's get cracking. Um, we write down um, the second moment and we can think combinatorially of the second moment as the number of pairs of satisfying assignments. So that means we need to look at any two truth assignments and we need to calculate the probability that both of them happen to be satisfying our random formula. So we sum on any pair of truth assignments and we calculate the probability that they both happen to satisfy our, for our random formula phi. So, uh, right, so what's the probability of this? Well, if you think about this for a moment, um, you realize that this depends on how much sigma and tau agree. If sigma and tau agree a lot, for example, if they are precisely identical, then this probability here is going to be fairly large. Um, because in that case, if I satisfy, if the one of them is satisfying, then so is the other, simply because they are identical. And so it seems unsurprising that if sigma and tau are close together, they are, if they are similar, then also um, the probability that they both be satisfying is going to be fairly big. On the other hand, if sigma and tau are orthogonal plus minus one vectors, then it seems natural to think that the event that um, sigma is satisfying and the event that tau is satisfying are more or less independent. And therefore it seems like a good idea to uh, reorder this sum here according to the inner product of the true satisfying assignments. So we introduce uh, a variable L that runs from minus N to plus N. And then we, given L, we sum on all possible pairs of truth assignments whose scalar product is precisely equal to L. And it turns out that um, you can now write down the probability that they both be satisfying. And that probability turns out to be a half plus one plus L on N squared divided by 16, just as written here to the power of M to the power of M because the M clauses that we are looking at are independent. And so uh, to simplify this a little bit, I should get rid of this sum here and simply replace it by the number of pairs of assignments whose inner product is equal to L. And of course, that's just this binomial coefficient. So my second moment works out to be this sum of fairly simple, um, cute combinatorial terms. And uh, now this is a sum of a fairly, with a fairly small number of summons. So there's two n summons. And uh, if you look at these terms for a bit, you discover that they play um, on an exponential scale. So uh, maybe a good way of um, studying this sum is by taking logarithms. And if I take logarithms, um, the sum turns into, sorry, the sum turns into a max. Uh, and the binomial coefficient turns into an entropy. And the other term turns into the logarithm of what it used to be. And so I end up with a problem of maximizing on a single scalar parameter, this beautiful function here. And so this beautiful function is actually this red curve down here. And um, so I can maybe try and evaluate this function at a few places. So for example, one good place to evaluate pretty much any function is alpha equals zero. And at that point, um, the function value that I find is um, twice the log of my first moment. So what this means is that my second moment method is going to work 
So the second moment is going to be of the same order as the square of the first moment, if and only if this max here is attained at alpha equals zero. Unfortunately, it isn't. So as you can see in this picture, this blue line is uh, the tangent at alpha equals zero. Um, the max is actually attained somewhere way over here, somewhere way at a positive value of alpha. And this means that the maximum function value that I get here is actually a lot bigger than what I get at zero. And <clears throat> since I took a log, um, this translates into the second moment exceeding the square of the first moment by a factor that is exponential in M. So uh, yeah, this means I'm out of luck. And in fact, this actually works for any positive D. So what I learned from this is that my classical second moment method, um, unfortunately, bites the dust in this problem. Um, there's not a single positive D that I can use um, the second moment method in order to calculate my partition function. And of course, uh, from a purely classical combinatorics viewpoint, this leaves us at a loss. Um, so at this point, we probably have no good conjecture uh, as to what the typical value of log z should be. I mean, given that it's not the first moment, what else should it be? Uh, so we are, we are at a bit of a loss, I'm afraid, um, from a classical combinatorics angle, and uh, we wouldn't really know how to proceed. And uh, so that is presumably why this problem um, has been open for such a long time. So uh, it's been open for, for more than 20 years, I suppose. And uh, so one reason why it has been unsolved was presumably because um, the answer is non-trivial. In the next lecture, I'm going to show you how we can um, derive the answer using um, at first the, the cavity method and the ideas from statistical physics, things like belief propagation and um, what is called the replica symmetric ansatz. And, uh, how we will discover a stochastic fixed point equation, namely this one down here, whose solution is going to actually give us the correct answer in this problem. And um, what we will also see is that the answer is actually uh, a non-trivial function. It is not something as simple as, um, a, as a function that comes out of optimizing a scalar, but it is something that comes out of uh, solving a stochastic fixed point e equation, a fixed point equation on the space of probability measures. And subsequently, after uh, looking at this physics intuition for a little bit, you're going to see how we can actually turn this intuition into a theory. So uh, I think that's it for the first lecture. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, so um, let's uh, give everyone the possibility to unmute so that we can uh, give a, a round of applause to Amin for his talk. Okay, thank you. Uh,